And this is our prayer this morning, that you continue binding us together with those cords the enemy cannot break. Through your word, speak, challenge and comfort our hearts. Prepare us to be men and women after your own heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let's have our seats. And good morning and praise the Lord. There is nothing that brings joy to the Lord more than brethren dwelling together in unity. Unity is power. Unity accomplishes. Therefore, as we reflect in our homily this morning, Paul's final appeal to Christian unity. May we be united with him and with one another. Romans chapter 1 to 33 is divided in three sections. Chapter 1, or rather verse 1 to verse 13, is the continued call to bear with one another, which begins in chapter 14. Then, verse 14 to 21 is Paul, the minister to the Gentiles, or Paul's ministry to the Gentiles. And then, verse 23 to 33 is Paul's impeding visit to Rome. Let's now, with those three sections, redeem time and examine them. In verse 1, the weaker brother should be supported but should also be rebuked. You see, in 14, he says, if you are eating of meat, will be a stumbling block to your brother, then I'd rather you don't eat meat. But again, you know, you can abstain from meat and move to a vegetarian, but eat the wrong vegetables, like mohoka or mira. They are vegetables. Now imagine if I came to deliver this salmon, and as I deliver the salmon, I'm also chewing those things. You lose taste and interest in the salmon. So Paul is not saying, because he is a weaker brother, we tolerate him in his weakness. No. He is saying, yes, we acknowledge you have a shortcoming here. But let us try to get you out of your weakness. Now the problem is us. We don't like it when we are rebuked. Yet, 1 Timothy 3.16 tells us all scripture is God-breathed, profitable for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So, the weaker brother should not be left to deteriorate and ultimately we lose him. We need to come up with the ways of bringing him back. 
We should not, in verse 2, seek our own comfort. Let us look at the comfort of others as well. Sometimes seize the ground for the sake of others. For example, say it's a cooperative circle selling plots 50 by 100. They are going for 1 million. And you, because you have it, all I have it, I come and I buy 10 at a go. I deny others an opportunity. Paul is saying, as I care for my own comfort, I remember the comfort of others. Verse 5, Paul prays for their unity with one another, with one heart and one mouth, we glorify the Lord. Unity can make all break. Genesis 11, from verse 5 onwards, God said, let us go down See what man is doing. And when God came, man was building a tower. And God said, United as they are, whatever they want to do, they will do. Let us confuse their language. We can use our unity to build, but we can also use our unity to destroy. May we lean and long for positive unity. Unity of purpose, unity of the spirit. Now allow me to transit to verse 14 through 21. Paul, if Paul was to write to us the congregation of All Saints Cathedral this morning. Would he write these words? You yourselves are full of goodness, complete in knowledge and competent to instruct each other. Romans 15 and verse 14. Would he write those words to us? It is a call for each one of us to reflect and ask, am I a man or woman of goodness, knowledge of the word, and am I competent to instruct? without causing hearts. Brothers and sisters, the gap between a rebuke and an insult is very thin. Sometimes we insult, we say we have rebuked. You see, when I say to you, don't be stupid, then I start blagging, I have rebuked. The truth is I have not rebuked, I have insulted. To rebuke is to say, my brother, I don't think what you are doing is the right thing. Why don't you try it this way? Now, I have rebuked you, but I have also guided you. And we should rebuke and guide. We should not rebuke and leave it hanging. I don't think what you are doing is right and you leave it there. Then what is right? This is the prayer of Paul to the Roman church. And it is his prayer to us today to be full of goodness, 
complete in the knowledge of the word and competent to instruct each other. Verse 17, much as Paul has labored among the Gentiles, he is careful to give the credit to God. That is an advantage of knowledge, that it is not me doing it, rather it is God working in me. And may we learn to return credit, glory and honor back to God. He concludes in 23 through 33, the impending visit to Rome. Paul, at this time, he is heading to Spain. And Spain is part of the Roman colony. And he has a longing to see the Roman Christians, Acts 19 and 21, because Rome did not only house this church, but was the capital of Roman colonization, especially of the Middle East, the Palestine. Therefore, Paul wants to come and see these Christians. He finally, in Acts 28 and 16, arrived in Rome, but as a prisoner. The very Christians he was hoping they would receive and serve with him deserted him. 2 Timothy 4, 16. What is the lesson here, brothers and sisters? Do not put your hope on men. Men can fail you in a time. He was looking forward to work with men like Demas, men like Alexander the blacksmith, but they did him more harm than good. Paul is saying to us, as we offer ourselves to serve God, let's not hope in men. Let us hope in Christ. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.